Hey there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Now it's been a bit of a tough week for iPhone users as there have been lots of revelations about how insecure the iPhone is. So that sounds pretty bad. So if you wanna find out more, please let me explain. Now, before we get cracking, first of all, I want to say that actually this is a video about the iPhone problems that have been revealed this week, but actually this is a much more wider problem that affects iPhones and Android and Windows and so on. And I'll talk more about that towards the end of the video. The first part of this video is actually going to be talking about what was discovered this week that is particularly about the iPhone. And at the end, we'll have some more kind of global context, what it means about uh, security for all of us. So Google have a team who work to check the security of all devices that run Google software. So that means Android devices, yes, but it also means iOS devices, it also means Windows, it also means Linux, it also means and so on and so on. And this team, they are a highly skilled bunch of security engineers who work to see what problems exist at a security level in all these different devices. And this week they revealed the details of some problems that they found with the iPhone. Now these problems were reported to Apple back in February and Apple fixed them within seven days. So that's great. However, the problem is, is that two of the 14 vulnerabilities that were found were what's called zero day exploits. And that means a problem that neither Apple or Google or Microsoft or anyone else knew about, but somebody else did who was actually writing software to exploit that problem, that bug in the software. And from what it looks like, there were a bunch of websites that Google discovered that have been attacking iPhone users since iOS 10, that's 2016. Now these websites were constantly being updated with new attacks. And that in itself is a very worrying factor, which I'll talk about in a moment. But since 2016, for the last three years, if you visited one of these websites indiscriminately, not targeting you as an individual because your name is Fred, but actually just because you went to that website, your phone would have been hacked and things like your location and your uh, messages with inside your messaging apps would be transferred then to a central server for some spy agency to sift through. So the worrying thing is here is that this was mass indiscriminate surveillance. So this is clearly something that's been done by a nation state. And again, I'll talk more about that in a moment. So what actually happened? Well, what actually happened is that these websites would actually download a program onto the iPhone and it would then be able to transmit all that sensitive information to another place. Now, how did it do that? Well, there were several steps. Now, the first step is that every web browser runs JavaScript and everything we do is based today on the interaction between HTML, uh, uh, CSS, JavaScript and so on and how that gives us this rich web experience that we have today. Now, JavaScript is an interpreted language. That means it sees a line of code, it will do it. It sees the next line of code, it will do that and so on. However, because we are so reliant on JavaScript, now we have things called JITs, which are just-in-time compilers. In fact, they've been around for, for years. And what the JIT does, it takes the JavaScript, and at some point it says, well, this bit of code here is gonna be used a lot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it into the actual machine code for this device. So in this case, of course, it would be for the Apple uh, A devices, A11, A12, A10, and so on, which are, of course, ARM-based uh, processors. And so it creates the machine code for that particular piece of JavaScript. Now, the problem is that you can trick the JIT into producing machine code that you want. And the way you do that is if you wanted to, for example, this is one of the classic examples they give, exclusive awesome numbers together. If you provide it with 32-bit or even 64-bit numbers, those numbers, although they may appear like random numbers, are actually the operation code for the machine code that you actually want to run. So they're handcrafted, so someone has to know about how you know the machine code works. They handcraft it and they make that the number. And then when it produces the um, code in machine code, it's got that number. Those sequence of bytes are already there in the code. And then using another problem inside of the JavaScript, normally to do with JavaScript objects and bugs in the way that the JavaScript engine works, you can actually make it jump to that place and start executing those numbers which you put in there. Now at this point, you can get what they call shell access, which means you can start to run 
arbitrary programs for yourself. And one thing that the malicious software would do would be to download a binary from somewhere else, put it into a temporary directory and start running that. However, all of these processes on iOS are in what they call a sandbox, which means uh, iMessage can't have access to WhatsApp, WhatsApp can't have access to your web browser, or the browser can't have access to your Gmail, each is kind of independent. So what you need to be able to do is gain root access, that's kind of the top level administration access, and I have a whole video about what is root here on this channel. Okay, and once you have that, that gives you global access to all of the data across the whole phone. Now to get root access is not a normal thing you want, you should be given, an app has to find another vulnerability. And so these particular vulnerabilities, they found vulnerabilities in the iOS kernel, and they were able to use bugs in the kernel where they would call a particular kernel interface, a kernel system call, provide the wrong parameters, provide specially crafted parameters that would cause it to uh, go wrong. And then again, they were then able to uh, execute other code. Now at this point, if they're executing other code, it's running at the level of the kernel, which means it's at root level. So now that you've got root access because you're running at the kernel, you can then start running another program, which is the program that is able to access all of these different bits of information. And according to the researchers, they uh, demonstrated this, it could get access to your WhatsApp, to iMessage, to Telegram, to Gmail, to your location, to your photos, to everything, and that all gets sent up to a server. Now, I may have made that sound really, really easy. You just kind of do the JavaScript thing, you just kind of do the kernel thing, and suddenly you've got the, it's really, really complicated, and you need a lot of effort to actually do that, and a lot of skill. And the fact that this was on websites that were constantly being updated with new unknown exploits, new unknown bugs, shows that the level of investment in doing this is, of course, in the multi-million pound uh, area, which means it is a nation state. Now, Google have not revealed which nation state, they've not revealed which websites this was on, they've not revealed where the command and control servers were, where this data was being set back and forth. However, if you take it uh, in this kind of context, if it was a website that was in Arabic, for example, then it would be targeting a particular location. If it was in China, for example, it would again be targeting a, a certain location. If it was about a particular religion, if it was about a particular political movement, if it was about a particular topic, then of course it can target certain types of people. So you can imagine there are some nation states out there that would like to know what a group in a particular area who have a particular set of views are talking about and thinking about and writing about where they're going, who they're meeting, and then all that information is being sent and correlated and worked out who knows who, who's discussing what with who and who's what's going on. Because that's spying on a massive scale, an indiscriminate massive scale. And all iPhones, all iPhones, all iPhones were open to this kind of attack from 2016 through to 2019. Now, I did overemphasize there the fact that it's iPhones, but of course, we live in a world where this kind of thing is also going on on just about every platform. Now, this week's news was about the iPhone. We're pretty much sure that there are other attacks. This is what we know about. And it's not the only one that's been foiled. There are n examples of this that we don't know about. And we can pretty much guarantee that the same thing is going on on Android, the same thing is going on on Windows, the same thing is going on on a, a Mac OS. And these kind of exploits are a big business and they are a big part of the tool chest that spy agencies have. In fact, some of the revelations that Snowden gave us several years ago now was that uh, people like the American government have a tool chest of these kind of exploits. Now, I'd like to read you a quote from one of the authors who wrote up this stuff from Google, because this is really interesting about what they say about mass uh, level uh, surveillance. Real users make risk decisions based on the public perception of the security of these devices. And of course, that's what's telling us is that people thought that iPhones were more secure than Android. There was kind of a perception, if you buy an iPhone, you're better protected than if you buy Android. And today, that's proved to be not true. He goes on. The reality remains that security protections will never eliminate the risk of an attack if you are being targeted. 
To be targeted might mean simply being born in a certain geographic region or being part of a certain ethnic group. So as I said, when a nation state wants to attack a particular group, then they are able to do that and they will do so uh, indiscriminately. All that users can do is be conscious of the fact that mass exploitation still exists and behave accordingly, treating their mobile devices as both integral to their modern lives, but also as devices which, when compromised, can upload their every action into a database to be potentially used against them. Really, there's not much comment needed there. That is pretty sombering thoughts there. Now, while I was looking into this, I also went to a website that was kind of saying how iPhones are more secure than Android or more secure than other things. And this website went on to basically say there are no viruses or trojans or malware for iOS. And if they do exist, they're only attack devices that have already been jailbroken. So I want to talk a bit about jailbreaking just for a second. So jailbreaking is the intentional act of finding bugs in the kernel of the iOS kernel so that you can then gain root access uh, on your device and then you can perform certain customizations that iOS doesn't allow you to do, whereas Android may allow you to do some of those customizations by design. iOS tends to be much more strict in that sense. So some people jailbreak their phones. Now they jailbreak them using exactly the same techniques. These techniques are finding problems in the kernel. You call certain uh, APIs, you call certain system calls with the wrong parameters, with the specially crafted memory, and then actually it allows you to get through this very sophisticated process that then actually gives you root access. Now, what this massive surveillance has told us is that these exploits don't mind if your phone is jailbroken or not because it will do it for you. It will jailbreak it and then it will install its own software. It won't install the software that the jailbreakers want with their little app store and their little different programs. It will install what these uh, hackers want and it will actually go ahead and uh, start sending information. It also tells us that we really shouldn't jailbreak our iPhones, we shouldn't root our Android phones, because all we're doing is making our, the lives one e step easier for these uh, nation states. When they find a phone that's already been jailbroken, already been rooted, they can install their malware pretty easily without even to worry about trying to gain root access because we've given it to them already. So as I said, this is a problem not only for iOS, it is an industry-wide problem for Android and for Windows and for Mac OS. And the reason for that, and Linux of course, and the reason for that of course, is that any software, once it's being written and it's being run somewhere, if it has any kind of bugs in it, okay, bugs that may not appear in normal day operation because the interface is the interaction with the kernel is happening at a normal level, but when you throw in something unexpected to it, how does it handle that? What does it do with its memory? What does it do with the pointers? What does it do with the error conditions? That's when things can start to go wrong in every single computer. Even microcontrollers, even smartphones, even laptops, even Chromebooks, every single computer is susceptible to this kind of thing. And we need to wise up to that and understand what that means for our digital lives. Okay, my name is Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Don't forget I've got the new Speedtest G channel. And I suppose that's about it. I'll see you in the next one.